This is a canoe trip undertaken by three members of the Scottish Hostels Canoe Club, Dougie Gilchrist, Joe Reid and myself with the camera, and Ian Moore from the Fourth Canoe Club. The four canoes were designed by Joe Reid and built at home by the members involved. These Clyde canoes had proved themselves in previous trips as very good sea canoes. They carried a stack of gear, tents, sleeping bags, spare clothing, and enough food to last us for about 10 days without touching civilization. The boats you see are the Marchioness of Lorne and the Marchioness of Graham. And here we are on our way down the Brumilaw, as it's still called to this day. In the background you can see the old Kingston Bridge. There's no sailings from the Brumilaw now, so probably this was the last of these particular sailings. It was an overnight sailing with a lovely calm night across to London Derry on Ireland. Of course, in the old days, that was the feature of the Glasgow Fair fortnight, and most of Glasgow, at that particular time, left from the Brewer Law for their holidays down to Rothsay, Trun, etc. The cranes you see in the background are no longer there. Shipbuilding in the Clyde is almost non-existent now and in their place are high-rise flats. The weather itself was a lovely evening and proved to be a nice calm crossing across the Irish Sea. In fact, it was, the weather was that good we could have canoed across. But time was important. We went, wanted to spend as much time actually canoeing on the west coast of Ireland. Sleeping accommodation was non-existent and I mind because it was a lovely evening curling up in my sleeping bag round one of the chimney stacks on the boat to get the heat coming up from the engine room. It was very comfortable. This is us arriving in Londonderry, a lovely sunny morning, about seven in the morning. We embarked there with the canoes, put them on the folding trolleys that we have, and as we hadn't eaten much overnight, we were rather hungry, we were wandering about looking for a place to eat, and we smelled the lovely smell of ham and eggs being cooked somewhere. We wandered up this back street, the back door of one of the hotels, the doors were open, and inside were three or four women baking the breakfast. So they saw us standing in the doorway and they said, hey, can we help you lads? We said, aye, we'll look for somewhere to eat. And they said, just come in here. And they sat us down at the big plain wooden table and gave us a lovely big spread of ham and eggs and sausage. That was our first taste of the marvellous hospitality of the Irish people. This was, of course, long before the Troubles that beset the Ireland between the north and the south. Everybody was very friendly and very hospitable. We eventually made our way down to the railway station to try and find the best way to cross over to Donegal where we were going to start the actual trip. And it ended up in a big discussion with about half the station trying to figure out the best way to get these canoes across to Donegal. The solution was to put on a coal truck for us, an empty coal truck, and the canoes were transported across by rail. We reached the border at Straban, 
all the stuff was examined for any contraband etc. But of course we carried no contraband, just canoes and our camping gear and food. It's amazing actually what these canoes can carry. I reckon we can carry about three times as much as you could carry on a pack or a bergen. This is Donegal Square now and we are receiving some attention from the local people. Canoes on the folding trolleys and we made our way into one of the many bars around the square to sample the Irish whiskey, Johnny Powers and Jameson's Firewater, which proved rather strong for our palates. And after that we just stuck to the marvellous Guinness. The tents we carried were large 6x4 which gave us plenty of space for when we were held up with bad weather. The four of us on these trips we worked in pairs, two to a canoe carrying a loaded canoe down into the, the water. We looked after these canoes because they were either just canvas or PVC and we didn't drag them, they were lifted clear out of the water and onto the land. Weather is the most important thing in all these trips. If the weather proves too bad, we just stayed put. For example, if there's white tops out beyond, we would take second thoughts before venturing out. We always allowed for about three or four days, at least we might be held up with bad weather. It's not just a canoe trip in itself. They were a great means of exploration and meeting the local people because the canoes were a great attraction. These people out on the west coast of Ireland had never seen canoes before and quite often the flashing paddles were mistaken for deer swimming in. You might notice a, a lack of safety equipment here. We did carry life jackets, but I'm afraid we never used them as such. We depended on our seamanship with these canoes. We discovered this, these canoes could take marvelous big seas, breaking over the canoe itself or the spray deck. A good spray deck was essential so that a breaking sea didn't fill the canoe with water. Plus we adapted the angle of the, the paddle itself so that it was like a safety stroke in rough weather. The one thing different from the Irish coastline, it seemed to be in a bigger scale from Scotland's. Scotland is more sort of huddled together, a bit more cramped, where the Irish coastline is more spread out. There's a wee bit of a chop in this particular part here, but presents no problem. Just the odd wee breaking wave that the canoes are, can manage with no problem at all. We always kept together as a group for safety reasons. If something untoward did happen, we could help. Paddling these long distances, it's not so much the arms that were used, you swung from the waist, you used the, the weight of your body from the waist, swinging your weight from the shoulders onto the paddles. The arms in effect were just holding the paddles to keep them in the right position. It was just like walking in a long leisurely walk over a long distance, it became that used to it. We cover an average about 20 to 30 miles each day sometimes more. Doogie carried a biscuit tin which he converted into an oven and the 
crews were also controlled by a small rudder at the stern, which enabled you to paddle with equal strength on either side, because in certain conditions, a beam sea, you invariably find yourself paddling hard on the one side all the time. Joe Reed in particular on these trips would go absolutely native. Joe would strip off down to nothing at all apart from a straw hat. Didn't say much, but when he did, it was usually to the point and rather satirical. Great guy. PVC covering is very strong, but in the odd case of a mishap, we carry the repair outfit, usually a tube of Bostic and a spare bit of PVC or canvas. And that's the amount of gear we can carry in the canoe. And as you can see, we'd fed well, in fact, with all the home comforts. For fresh food, we carried fishing lines, trawled for fish, which helped supplement our diet. This is a huge sea cave that we ventured into, pitch black inside. There's no commercial traffic taking you around these more isolated communities. Here we are landing at another nice sandy beach. Do we come in? And here we are off to visit one of the Guinness shops. They were marvellous features on the west coast, dotted all over the place. One half of the shop would be food, stuffs, etc. Another half would be the bar, selling pints of Guinness and whiskey. And Joe and Doogie are like two Mexican banderos. And donkeys everywhere, and carts. A great means of cheap transportation. Donkeys and horses. And as it was their livelihood for these people, they were generally very well looked after. Pony and trap. Great way to get about. It's Joe studying the map. I always carried good maps. And of course, before these trips, maps were studied over and over again. So you knew instinctively where you were, or what you were going to face. You could tell by the contour of the maps what were cliff and what were sandy beaches. So it was important that the weather was good if you were canoeing around a part of the coast that was cliff bound. We certainly didn't venture out in areas like that if the seas were rough because there was no place to land, and you could end up in serious trouble. So as you can see in this shot, the sea is just a gentle swell rising and falling, allowing us to survey the bird life, which cover these cliffs and take city shots. I certainly would like to be out in a place like that, if it was blowing a southwester gale with huge breaking seas coming in, you would be asking for trouble there. Here are some of the locals we, we met, very friendly people, hard men but kind. And the kids, there was always a lot of kids about. And when we landed, we usually got a great reception. There a crowd of kids down, or one or two of the locals, 
absolutely amazed when they saw the canoes being emptied and the mountain of gear that we carried. The smallest craft that they had at that time were the currachs, which they used for fishing mainly. Marvellous sea boats, no power, just four strong men on big heavy oars. Coming in with their catch of fish. That was one staple food of these trips. In the canoes we carried trolling lines and invariably we would put these lines in towards evening before we reached a campsite. We would catch a considerable amount of fish, at least enough to provide a nice meal. One of man's greatest inventions was the primus stove. And there was nothing better after maybe a wet day or a long day out in the canoe to get the tent up and hear the roar of the primus stove inside the tent. It did two things. It heated the tent up in minutes and at the same time brewed up your tea and cooked your food. This is another exposed part of the, the coast and again, as I say, it's important the weather is kind, fairly calm. Again, a wee bit more of a chop here, but as I've said, these canoes are very seaworthy and well able to cope with the conditions. If it got any rougher, we would alter the paddle stroke, feather the blades and go into what's called low gear, so there's a paddle in the water every second. The canoes, marvellous craft for these types of expeditions. Again, another great reception with some of the local kids as we landed with the canoes. This part of the trip we're rounding down into Ackle Sound, and as you can see, the weather's still holding good. And inside one of the marvellous Guinness shops, that one half are drink. Guinness, etc. Another half is food. Again, the hospitality was marvellous. We kept thinking or asking, when do you close? And they just stared at us vacantly. We never close. We found ourselves playing darts for a tanner at one in the morning in one of the places we were in, much to the amusement of the local people because these people were out crofting most of the day and they would wander into the bars around about 10 or 11 at midnight for a drink. And I mind of sitting in one of the, these Guinness shops and up came a big plate of lovely ham sandwiches on the house. And this is coming down through Ackle Sound, looking down onto Ian Moore. And the colours coming in with a catch of fish. Hardly men. In those days, there were no life jackets. But I hear from my friend who's been out there recently, they now have to carry life jackets which is probably a good thing, because they're out in all kinds of weather. Clare Island was one of those lovely islands just a few miles off the west coast. We visited the local village inn late on at night, fish hanging from the rafters, and we consumed a few pints of Guinness there, played the booty, and there were two giant men standing with their backs towards us at the bar, and eventually one of them a giant of a man with a mop of fiery red hair strode into the middle of the room, lantern swinging above his head, and gave us a fantastic rendering 
of the shooting of Dan McGrew. A marvellous episode on the trip. Scared the hell out of us. We had us cowering behind the table at one point. Lovely silver sandy beaches. Dyes too were great lover of horses. Horses all over the place. As long as there's a piece of flat ground, the canoes can be lifted clear of a rocky beach, pegged down if need be if the wind got up, and we carried very good camping equipment, so if we were stuck, we were quite comfortable. With Doogie applying a wee patch to his canoe, easily patched and repaired. Though on all these trips I never had serious trouble with any really damaging, even though they were canvas or PVC, they're very tough. The donkey here is carrying a load of peat and he saw he was talking to this owner behind us and he said if you're going to stand here blethering I'm going to unload these creels of peat. So the donkey knelt down, unloaded one bag and then it rolled over and unloosened the other. And here's this chap refilling the, the creels with the peat. Peat was the main source of fuel in these parts. Lovely burning fuel, the lovely scented smell. A general view looking from Clear Island back on to the mainland. The castle. And the curragh. And here's Ian Moore, he's been attacked by a large crab onto his big toe. Lobster and crab were a nice delicacy. Fresh crab or lobster boiled up in seawater. Very nice indeed. And tearing the curragh. And the thatched cottage behind. And from there we went on to another island, Inish Turk. And the mind of one big stout woman come down to the tent with a big ashet of potato and macaroni and cheese. Very hospitable people. A bit of a sea coming in here so we didn't move that day. As I said before, in previous trips, if the weather was bad we just stayed put. So all the trips in the west coast of Scotland, Ireland was an exception, but similar. Hospitality on the Crofton communities up in Uist and the Hebrides is similar or identical to the hospitality shown on these isolated communities in the west coast of Ireland. They can't do enough for you. You would wander off for a walk and come back to the tent and find the fresh eggs inside the fly sheet or a pint or two of milk, or some homemade scones. That was typical. They always attracted a large audience of kids who were very interested in what we were doing and where we came from. Donkeys uh, offered no threat at all, very tame, domicile animals. And the uh, Irish setter, a very high, strong, strong dog. And like most dogs, they love the water. Can't get enough of it. And at last, we're back in civilization. It was a lovely guest house. We're back in the mainland on a place called Renville House. 
and Joe is sitting back here nice and relaxed after having a very enjoyable canoe trip around a coastline with very hospitable people. From there we portaged inland down into Loch Corrib. It's acidic, not very nice at all. And from Loch Corrib we went down the river Corrib, ending up in Galway itself. And from Galway we got the train back across to Dublin, back by boat. The Irish have youth hostels like we have in Scotland. A great cheap way of accommodating young people who like to travel lightly. It's amazing how you, you can remember so much, but watching the film again it certainly jars your memory as to what happened at that particular time. And I've no doubt the Irish people are just as hospitable as they were then as they are now. And so ended a most enjoyable trip round the west coast of Ireland. And much as I would like to go back, it's doubtful at my age <laughs> that I would go back again. But it's, it's great looking back on the film to see what it was like. <laughs>